Okay. And Wes, can you keep track of time then? I'm going to run out of hands. So the rules for lightning talks have always been three minutes for the talk and you know, within 10 seconds of your limit, I start squeaking the chicken. And if you exceed your limit, I continually squeak the chicken. We have to extend this to, we have to extend this to our virtual presenters, especially Lori, because I know for a fact she's going to go 10 seconds over. So the, uh, our first presenter is virtual. We're going to have, I think, three virtual presentations, three minutes followed by one minute of questions. And then uh, Luca and uh, Mylena are here in person in the front row, and they're going to execute with remarkable timeliness, and we'll have a full minute for questions after their talk, and then we'll have some more virtual talks. And then on Friday, we'll have a much more in-person talks. So without further ado, let us roll the tape on our side. Yeah, how do I make it louder? Okay. Different work that's come out in the last year. So I think that would be fault not to mention different things that companies are doing. So Google has created two new major releases. They released health specific embeddings, both for dermatology and pathology, which is pretty neat as well as skin, a new resource where they have more representative skin tones in different conditions with uh, different degrees of estimates on diseases based on multiple dermatologists. So both these are very valuable resources that they make public. Uh, additionally, in keeping with the trend of industry, there was a FDA cleared AI power device that can fix skin cancer, which is pretty interesting. Uh, it was previously used commonly in uh, the EU to help PCPs diagnose things uh, for major classes of skin cancer, and it has been now allowed in the States. So more things have also come out. Uh, Google's not the only one that released data sets. There's a skin cat that recently came out, a multimodal data set, at tail first captions. We're finding that previously a lot of the data sets were only really just the image as well as the diagnosis, and now we're getting a lot of information on features, which is making it pretty valuable. Team of interesting research, there's been a lot of cool papers out in top tier journals about different dermatological things. One of them is looking at diagnoses and having explainable features that are very interesting. And it showed that when you have these explainable features, you have higher confidence, or your doctors have higher confidence in the diagnosis. So it really takes away from the black box image of a lot of uh, AI models and really enhances its uh, usability. Another one is showing that, that when we look at different skin tones, even if we improve the diagnosis, we still have this gap between different skin tones and some skin tones. Uh, work better with different AI models because of the way they're trained with using different data sets of inherent bias, and that even when you improve performance, sometimes that bias still exists, which is very interesting to know, and be cognizant of when we use these improvable the devices. There's also been a lot of really cool papers in pathology. So these cover dermatopathology pathology because they're general models, but they're not dermatopathology specific. So there's a multimodal general AI copilot human pathology, which just came out in Nature, so a very interesting paper, as well as a foundational model for clinical rate computational pathology pathology of rare cancer detection. So these are both very cool things that just recently came out. Continuing with interesting research uh, in nature medicine, there was a transparent model which made images via image text foundation on grounded medical literature. So showing that even if you don't have those high quality annotations I mentioned are valuable, you can still create them. As well as uh, another paper showing that you can get good performance fine tuning multimodal LMs with terms of data. Just showing that we don't necessarily have to use these uh, out of the box models made by large companies. And that's all. Thank you very much. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, it'll probably be best if uh, for the presenters that are virtual, um, if you ask questions in chat, but I can, I or the other moderators can relay them if you have them in person. Okay, well, that's helpful too. I'm not touching this. This is potentially a haunted house. Okay. All right, so our next speaker is uh, Parikshit Nanda from uh, the University of Michigan Medical School. A good solid two hours away, but apparently everybody has COVID lately, so. Uh, we, we welcome uh, Dr. Nanda virtually to present on 
bringing your own bioconductor to your cluster using Singularity CE and Aptainer. And having used Singularity, I'm very excited about this to see if somebody survived this. Hello, bioconductors. So today we're going to learn how to bring your own bioconductor packages to your cluster using Singularity CE or Aptainer. And so the scenario is if you have a hard to install set of R or bioconductor packages and you're trying to run them in the batch system and they won't easily install on your research cluster, what do you do? So if you were using your own machine, uh, bioconductor officially provides Docker images that you could use and, and modify. However, Docker isn't installed on, on many research clusters with good reason because a batch system needs to start and stop a process, but Docker needs to continuously run. So instead, what you can do is create these portable singularity containers, starting with the bioconductor Docker images. And so the way you do this is you need two, two ingredients. So you, you need to have a cluster that already has a singularity or aptainer installed. And so um, typically you would see if software is installed using the module commands, module avail, but it may not show up, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It may be locally installed on the machine. And if you just type the singularity command, it might already be there. The second thing you need is in order to generate the image, you need root access to a Linux machine or a virtual machine that, that runs Linux where you can uh, build the singularity image. And you'll see how to do that next. So in order to create this image, you need a source text file. And so we're going to call this byob.def. And you can see there's five lines that I'm showing. So the, the first line says we're, we're going to use Docker as a source to, uh, to build our image and build on top of that. And we're going to say we can use the bioconductor Docker development version. And the post section is where the installation actually happens um, into the image. And we run commands just like you would in Docker. So apt-y install is to install any exotic packages that you need for your packages to work. And the uh, bioconduct, BioC manager install is to install any other sets of packages that you need that you can you know, build up even to hundreds of packages and that, that would, would still work. So the command, once you have the source file, the command you use to take the source file and produce the image is called singularity build, the name of your output and your source. And then once you have uh, the built image, you can and you can copy it to cluster and run the exec command with the image and either R script to run a non-interactive job inside of your batch script or run R if you're trying to debug something interactively. And so what we've learned here is we've seen a way that we can combine R packages, bioconductor, all into a single file that we can copy around anywhere that there is singularity. Um, note that the architecture of how you build singularity has to uh, match the machine that's being run on. So if you're running on an x86-64 machine, you have to build inside of an x86-64 virtual machine or an x84-64 system. Um, you get all the benefits of Docker with the additional benefits of portability and reproducibility. So that source file we used is actually saved into the, the final image. It removes a barrier to complex workflows. And if you'd like to learn more, uh, please see these two links for the Singularity user guide and the Biconductor Docker page. I know for a fact that Dr. Nanda is online. Is anybody, it would probably be best to ask online again, but I'm, I and the moderators are happy to relay if necessary. Has anybody else here tried to use Singularity to package up um, Docker packages? If this works as advertised, I will say it must be less painful than what I encountered. So thank you, Dr. Nanda. Um, ooh, up next, in person. Well, I'm not a doctor yet. <laughs> okay, so my talk is going to be a little bit different from what you guys have been he hearing so far. Um, that's because I'm applying what you were doing into my research. So I'm going to tell a short story about a tyrosine phosphatase called PGPRH and what this tyrosine phosphatase is doing in terms of regulating biological processes in lung cancer. So by definition, tyrosine... Um, Tyrosine phosphatases are those that are going to dysphosphorylate tyrosine residues, so that's their canonical role. But unlike tyrosine kinases, which are very well studied because of their importance as oncogenes, 
Nobody cares about our info of this, so we don't know much what they are doing in the cell. So to address this question, I'm doing two main experiments. One is to find out what proteins are interacting with my phosphatase, and I'm using a proximity-dependent vaccination assay for that, also known as BioID. I'm also overexpressing PHPRA to see how that is affecting the gene expression, and I'm using RNA sequencing. So if you see here these two volcano plots and also the Venn diagram, so for both of these experiments, I used two long adenal carcinoma cell lines, H23 and H2023. And what was surprising was to see that the interacting proteins that are found in both of these cell lines, they, are, they had very little overlap. So probably this phosphatase is behaving differently according to the cellular context. However, I'm going to call your attention to three proteins here that achieved the highest log twofold change, but smallest p-value. One is CDK5 rep3, which is involved in cell cycling progression. The other one is EIF2 AK2, which is a kinase involved in transcription regulation, and PHPRH itself. So we think that PHPRH is basically as a dimer in our cells. We then got all these interacting proteins and we ran a functional analysis. And there are a bunch of overlapping terms here, so I'm going to call your attention to where the yellow arrows are. But we found that these proteins are mainly involved in translation processes in the mitochondria and also the ribosome, as well as activity of RNA binding and ATPase binding. We then overexpressed this phosphatase, and then we found that over 2,000 genes were downregulated and over 1,300 were upregulated. When we ran pathway enrichment analysis, we saw that there was an overlap with what we had found for BioID. So most of the processes that this phosphatase is um, regulating is related to RNA, RNA splicing and mRNA processing. So what we conclude is that there is very little overlap of protein-protein interactions between these two long adenal carcinoma cell lines, and that this phosphatase is mainly involved in translation, RNA binding, and regulating helicase activities. That I conclude, and thank you. <laughs> person presenters and not even have the courtesy to ask a question. So the overlap uh, for PTPRH, uh, the other um, protein phosphatase that I'm familiar with is uh, PTPRC or CB45. Right? Okay. So I would say completely uh, ignored, but you're right, they don't get the same attention as, as TKIs, or sorry, as uh, TKs. So my question then is, um, why do you suppose that, uh, is, is there a biological reason for the protein-protein interactions observed, and are any of these cleavage-specific? Is there a possibility that it's a different um, cleavage form of PTPRH, for example, interacting with EIF2A, K, um, or uh, CD5, CDK5, uh, RAP3, in each of the cell lines? So wait, can you rephrase your question? <laughs> so the, these were the two top interactors yeah. across yeah. the cell lines, right? Um, you mentioned that the cell lines are otherwise not very much like Yes. So my, my question then is, um, is there a possibility that it, it's, are there additional protein isoforms of PTPRH, for example, the way there are of mm. uh, CD45 that might be differential interacting? No, no, not for, so we don't know much about, for example, the kinetics of PTPRH or like if there are substrates and this kind of thing. So that's why I was doing this work. So it's very hard to base on the literature right now because we have so very little information that is hard to tell. Um, the reason why I start looking at pitch bridge is actually because we found um, some overlap with the EGFR pathway. Uh, I just didn't mention that here because I didn't have time. <laughs> um, but yeah. Sounds like more research to me than just research. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So our next speaker is VAI's very own Luca Fagnocci, and uh, there will be no copyright violations whatsoever. And uh, hope to hope you'll be excited to be introduced to the uh, Puspicitis Lab uh, automated DNA methylation analysis product. And Dr. Fagnocci will be introduced. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm talking about uh, CISM Street today, which is this automated pipeline to perform mouse DNA methylation array analysis. Um, 
Uh, this tool uh, relies on uh, another couple of tools that were developed here at the Van Allen Institute by these investigators. Uh, the first one is the mouse DNA mutation array, 300,000 probes almost. Uh, this was published in 2022 and is now available from Illumina. Uh, the second tool is uh, Sesame, which is a bioconductor package uh, designed by uh, Wang Ding Zhu. And uh, really this package is to perform DNA mutation uh, array analysis uh, in mouse, in humans, and you can do everything from the pre-processing uh, to uh, the data modeling, uh, differential mutation analysis, uh, probes annotation, everything. And that's why we use the, these uh, packets to perform and to generate our automated pipeline in Andrew Specific Lab. And so uh, the pipeline basically only needs uh, an input directory in which you have uh, your uh, raw data, uh, a metadata file in which you annotate your samples, obviously, and then a formula in which you state uh, which is the contrast that you want to investigate in the differential methylation analysis. And you can also include all the coverage that we want from the metadata file. And then the, the tool in a non-metadata way will uh, generate these uh, folders, a QC folders uh, with uh, QC results, uh, uh, detection rates, uh, uh, die bias, and so on and so forth. Uh, a dimensional reduction analysis uh, with a PCA, TSNE, UMAP, uh, and samples colored by your contrast uh, condition and by uh, all the uh, coverage that uh, you input in the formula. And then finally, the DMR folders, which is basically your differential methylation analysis with some useful uh, um, um, plots like volcano plots, heat maps, uh, uh, probability analysis, geo analysis, uh, and uh, other stuff. Um, again, as I said, we use this tool a lot in the lab. So here are just a couple of examples from uh, real data analysis. Uh, in last year, in, uh, we published in Cell Metabolism uh, the existence of two distinct beta cell subtypes, uh, which are epigenetically distinct uh, by K27 trimethyl uh, histone marks, as you can see here. And then we also found that they are distinct from their DNA methylation profile. And what's interesting is that uh, uh, one type of this beta cell is uh, uh, hypermethylated in regions that are uh, uh, normally associated to K27 trimethyl. So merging basically these two uh, epigenetic marks uh, and, uh, fu and functionally distinguishing uh, these two beta cell subtypes. In this uh, bioarchive report instead, it is now uh, under revision in uh, Nature Cancer. Uh, we use a tree model of uh, uh, phenotypic variation in which we have uh, two isogenic mice which are different from their phenotypes and from cancer susceptibility, we map their uh, uh, DNA methylation differences, uh, again using uh, Sesame Street and the uh, array, and we identify a gene signature, uh, which is now also able to uh, stratify human patients, uh, <laughs> human patients, <laughs> according to uh, their uh, cancer uh, susceptibility. So that's it. The tool is available on GitHub. Check it out if you're interested. Somebody is magically manipulating this from far away. Beautiful. Oh, it's Lori. Okay. So. You may have seen Lori's talk earlier. She's the, the, the voice of God in the package demo. So we welcome her back to the stage. Hello, my name is Lori Shepard Kern, and I'm a member of the Bioconductor Core team. I wanted to briefly mention a few opportunities on how to get involved with Bioconductor and the Bioconductor community. There are a number of simple ways to get involved, including participating in discussions on Slack, answering questions on the support site, providing uh, pull requests, and submitting your own package. But I really wanted to highlight three other opportunities. The first is to become a package reviewer. Anyone that has submitted a package to Bioconductor is eligible to become a package reviewer. A package reviewer performs a technical review of newly submitted packages to ensure that the package is meeting bioconductor standards and guidelines, like having executable vignettes and reusing existing bioconductor infrastructure so that the package can seamlessly integrate into the bioconductor ecosystem. The process for becoming a package reviewer involves doing an onboarding session to review package guidelines and reviewer expectations, and then performing some test reviews with the current reviewer to ensure consistency, after which an individual will be assigned solo package reviews. 
We're always in need of package reviewers. We currently only have six to eight active reviewers at any given time, so the more reviewers, the lighter the load for everyone. The next opportunity is bioconductor working groups. So we feel like bioconductor strength is its community and we want to encourage individuals working on similar projects to connect with one another to move science and innovation forward. We also recognize that members of the community can recognize gaps and shortcomings in bioconductor and we hope that individuals may join or form working groups in areas of interest. We have a working groups page that lists the currently active working groups and anyone wishing to join can reach out to the leads or their designated Slack channel there's also a listed page for needed working groups. These are working groups that the Community Advisory Board or Technical Advisory Board may have recognized a need in the community, but currently don't have a lead or anyone to push a group forward for um, achieving its initiatives. We do keep track of past working groups as well so that everyone can get credit and put on their CVs. And by all means, if there's a working group here that you feel like is needed in the bioconductor community but isn't listed, please feel free to start one. The last opportunity is to apply to become part of the Community Advisory Board or the Technical Advisory Board. Elections are held yearly for any open seats and we encourage all levels to apply. The Technical Advisory Board tends to focus on more scientific representation and infrastructure for Bioconductor, while the Community Advisory Board focuses more on community-centric efforts like diversity and education. And I would like to encourage that anyone that is not elected to try to get in the future because we often have many qualified candidates and hope that you'll get involved with some of these other opportunities in the meantime. And I believe both boards are accepting nominations currently until the end of August for this year's elections. Feel free to reach out to me via email or Slack with any questions. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Unfortunately, I do have COVID and was un unable to attend the conference in person this year, but I hope you're all enjoying your time at BioC 2024. It's always a highlight of my year. Thank you. So our next presenter is Daniela Corbetta from the University of Padova uh, with her uh, lightning talk on SC Conform. Hello everyone, my name is Daniela and I'm going to speak about the SC Conformer package for uncertainty quantification for cell type annotation. Cell type annotation is a fundamental task in single cell RNA sequencing analysis. The goal is to predict the cell type of a new unknown cell in a query data set starting from a reference data set of already annotated cells. The standard approach involves selecting a model, training it on the reference dataset, and then predicting the cell types for the cells that are in the query dataset by choosing the cell type to which the model is assigning the highest score or probability. However, this approach lacks uncertainty quantification and can therefore be unreliable, especially when the model's predictive probabilities indicate varying levels of confidence in its point predictions. For example, if we look at this heat map that is showing the predicted probabilities for all the considered cell types for three different cells, we can see that uh, in the first case, the model is certain that uh, the cell is a smooth muscle. In the second case, it is fairly confident that it is a TCD4+, plus, while in the third case, the point prediction is meaningless because there are many labels with uh, comparable predicted probabilities. As a solution, instead of a single point prediction, we can return a prediction set. There is a set of different labels that we think our cell might be. Working with uh, cell types, uh, we also have some additional information that uh, can guide us into doing this, because we know that cell types are organized into a graph structure that we can retrieve uh, from the cell ontology. And this suggests uh, a different way of quantifying uncertainty, because instead of returning a prediction set that comprises different labels that are possibly unrelated and very far in the hierarchy, we can return um, an ancestor of the predicted class. And the more unsure we are of the point prediction and the higher up in the hierarchy, this ancestor will be. To do this, we propose a method based on conformal inference, which is a distribution free statistical framework that returns prediction sets that have the property that so they will contain the true label with a user chosen probability. This means that if we set this probability to 0.9 and we have 100 cells, um, 
at least 90 of them will have their true label within the prediction set. Conformal inference is based on uh, splitting the reference data set into two subsets, a training data set used to fit the model and a calibration data set used to adjust the size of the prediction set. And the only assumption of this framework is that the cells in the um, calibration data set need, need to be exchangeable with the cells in the uh, query data set. And if you're curious on how to verify this, you should follow Anthony Christie's um, package demo on the SC diagnostic package. We've implemented this method in the SC conformer package that is currently available on GitHub, but will be soon submitted to Bioconductor. So if you're curious, just check it out and explore its functionalities. So uh, as acknowledged in the previous talk, as it happens, uh, Tran, Tran Nguyen will be our next uh, presenter on Alpha Miss Sensor. Hi, everyone. My name is Tran Nguyen, and I'm a postdoc at Harvard Medical School. And today I'm excited to present our package, Alpha Miss Sensor, developed in collaboration with Martin Morgan, as well as the other folks here on the slide. Alpha MISSENSE is an AI model from Google DeepMind that predicts pathogenicity scores for MISSENSE mutations across all possible amino acid substitutions in the human genome. And so this resource of over 70 million variants is available on Zenodo. But to enhance the accessibility of these resources, Martin developed the package Alpha MISSENSE R. And we've been working closely together to greatly expand the capabilities of this package and to also integrate resources here from Harvard. This package gives ready access to all alpha missense data, so data sets, um, which are loaded in as a memory efficient WDB table. And this package also seamlessly integrates with other bioconductor workflows, such as genomic ranges, allowing for detailed explorations of specific regions of interest. Um, so for example, one can easily tally all the alpha, alpha missense pathogenicity classes broken down by the exons of a gene, as I've done here on the bottom right. And Alpha Missions R also provides extensive visualization capabilities. So the implementation of the R3D mole package allows the user to overlay Alpha Missions pathogenicity scores on an interactive 3D protein structure. And we've been working to expand these interactive capabilities with Gosling, a grammar-based visualization toolkit developed here at Harvard. And this integration with Gosling makes it easy to produce a wide variety of web-based interactive displays, such as the bar plot that I'm showing here on the right. And finally, a major component of this package is the integration with other large bioinformatic databases. And so this package integrates with ClinVar, a data set of over 80,000 clinically relevant missense variants, um, and makes this information easily accessible as a DuckDB table, and also provides functionality for plotting with just a simple one-line command. And this provides an excellent resource for interrogating and validating the, uh, variants. And finally, we've been working to incorporate ProteinGym, a database of over 200 deep mutational scanning assays, um, as well as leaderboard scores for over 70 high-performing models. And so this integration with ProteinGym makes for a really useful framework to evaluate and assess the performance across multiple variant prediction tools. So in conclusion, Alpha Missense R provides a wealth of resources and functionality for the exploration of Missense variant predictions and is available now on Bioconductor. So please check it out. Thanks. presenters are running under. I have to wonder whether ESM3, for example, gets crammed into a framework like this, but look forward to seeing whether that actually makes it in. Our uh, next, and if I'm not mistaken, final presenter will be Tyrone Lee, also from Harvard Medical School, uh, presenting on Olama or Oyama R. Hard for me to say. Um, welcome. Hello, my name is Tyron Lee. I'm a senior software developer at Harvard Medical School, and this is a quick lightning talk on Olama R. So when I wanted to start local development of large language models within my team, I found the Olama platform the most convenient for running and deploying these models. It has integration libraries for both Python and JavaScript, 
But unfortunately, there are members of my team that are allergic to both. They were our developers. So I wanted to see if there was a better way to integrate Olama into R. And I found it with the Olama R library developed by House Lin. Here, I will show you how this integration with R works. This package can be installed from CRAM or through DevTools. You should also have the Olama service installed and running on your machine with enough RAM or VRAM to run the models. So Olama can be controlled through its REST API. Thus, this library wraps functions with ACTR2 to make requests to the Olama server. This way, we can work with the Olama service programmatically. To generate a text completion, we use the generate function, give it a model name and text prompts, and this will return an HTTR2 object by default. But we can also stream the output or format it in a text or vector output. One of the key features of Olama is the ability to extract vector embeddings of a prompt or a text string. Here, we can use the embedding function to create a length normalized vector output. Then use the sum to compute cosine similarity. This could be very useful for LLM evaluation or developing semantic search. Olama is an ongoing project and this R library is also a work in progress. I still encourage you to try this out if you have an interest in local development of LLMs. If you have any questions, reach out to me on GitHub or on the Bioconductor Slack. I thank you for your time and have a good one to everyone in Michigan and on the web. Unless there have been any very late entries, this concludes our lightning talk. So we've got a, uh, a beverage and bio break, and then at uh, 4.30 we'll have uh, Meet the Tab and Cab.